This is part 81 of my series on my Engage Model Railway project. Previous parts covered the project from its inception through the creation of the baseboard, selection and laying of track, building of scenic items, obtaining rolling stock, etc. The project is ongoing. This part is by way of being an analysis of my layout as it currently stands, a detailed review of the whole track layout and how it is controlled, and then an overview of the various scenic items. Here's a view of the whole layout with all the lines highlighted in color and color coded to distinguish the various sections. All of the switching points are also marked, the double crossover marked X1 and the points marked P2 to P11. This is all Kato tracking components. Uh, the crossover and all of the points are Kato items which are electrically switched, each controlled by a Kato Levo controller. There are two separate power and control zones. I'm using DC, not DCC. Each of the two power and control zones is powered and controlled completely separately with no transmission of power between them. So two trains can be run at the same time, one on each power zone with no interference between the two. The power feeds into the track are marked in dark blue. OP for power feeds to the outer zone and IP for power feeds to the inner zone. The Cato points switch the track power. That is to say, track power flows over the points only in the direction in which the point is set. All power on my layout is fed into the main lines other than for the turntable, which is a special case. So if, for example, there is a siding with a point diverting into it from the main line, the siding will be unpowered unless the point is set to divert into the siding. So a train can be taken into a siding, then the point for the siding can be set back to the main line, and now no power will flow to the siding, and the train can remain parked in the siding without being affected in any way when another train is operated on the main line. Now let's try to go through the various sections of the track layout individually and review their power and control. This image shows all of the lines which form part of the outer power and control zone. Power is fed in at the three points marked OP in dark blue. This powers the main outer circuit shown in red. Power will only flow to the outer siding shown in purple if the respective points are set to divert into the siding. The double crossover marked X1 is a special case. Although it physically consists of four sets of points, it is a single unit controlled by a single control lever which throws all four points at once, and no power flows across this unit at all in any direction regardless of how its points are set. This crossover allows trains to be moved between the inner and outer power and control zones. It does not pass any power between the zones, so when a moving train between one zone, when moving a train between one zone and the other, you must have the power on the receiving line set similarly to the power on the sending line before the train gets to the crossover in order for the train to continue to run across. Quite honestly, trains still quite often get stuck on the crossover even if the power is set correctly, since there is inevitably a dead zone in the middle, and locos with few pickups struggle to get over that dead zone unless moving quite fast to provide momentum. I sit at bottom centre when controlling the layout, and I deliberately put the crossover close to me so that I would be able to help trains across it when needed. In my original design, I had the crossover on the far left, just as the lines came into Colville Station from the tunnel, and it would have been good to be able to switch tra trains over as they came into that main station, but having the crossover over there would have been too problematic given the tendency for trains to get stuck when crossing over. There doesn't seem to be any problem when trains proceed straight through the crossover, except that it has a lot of guide rails between the tracks, and so it can be a derailing threat to rolling stock that sits low between the rails. This image shows all of the lines which form part of the inner power and control zone. Power is fed in at the two points marked IP in dark blue. The orange line is the shared section of the inner zone. The two power feed points are at the two ends of this orange line. 
This means that the orange line is always powered, and the other lines are only powered when points are set so that power can flow to them from the orange line. The turntable is a special case. It has its own power feed, which comes from the main inner power controller, the same as the two IP points, but then flows through the turntable's own dedicated controller, which controls the position of the turning table, and combines with the main inner controller to control the movement of locos on the table and its parking lines. Now let's quickly review how points control the various sections of the two zones. Here's all of the outer zone again. When all the points are in their normal positions, only the main outer circuit will be powered, as shown here. Any locos in any of the sidings will receive no power and will remain stationary. Note that the default position of all points is straight, except for P10 in the bottom right-hand corner, the default position of which is turning, so this, since this point needs to turn the traffic in order for it to pass along the main outer circuit. If P3 is set to turn, it will pass power into the outer down sidings in the corner, as shown here. If P4 is in its default straight setting, power will now flow into the outer down siding, as shown. If P4 is then set to turn, with P3 still set to turn, power will now flow into the inner downsiding, as shown here. Now let's assume P3 is set straight again, and P9 is set to turn. This will route power into the inside downsiding, as shown. If P10 is set straight, it will route power into the scrapped-off goods siding in the bottom right corner. If P2 is set to turn, it will route power into the outer upsiding in the corner. Now back to the inner zone. All inner lines are coloured here, but they would never all be powered at once. There are two ways of taking a circuit round the inner zone, two branch lines, if you will. P5 and P6 control the switch over between these two branches. Normally, P5 and P6 would be switched over at the same time, although they do have separate control levers and can be set independently for special cases. When P5 and P6 are both in their default straight positions, power will flow round the outer branch of the inner zone, shown in green, and trains will go round that way. The shared orange section is always used by trains circuiting the inner zone. Trains must go on to the green outer branch in order to cross over to the outer zone, since the crossover X1 is on the green outer branch. When P5 and P6 are set to turning, power will flow to the inner branch of the inner zone, shown in white, and trains will circuit that way. Note that power also must be set to flow this way for power to flow into the yard, since the yard is fed from the inner branch at P7. When P7 is set to turn, with power of course P6 and P5 also being set to turn, power will flow into the yard and trains will be diverted that way. If P8 is in its default straight position, locos will go down the feeder line to the turntable. If the table itself is lined up with the feeder line, as shown here, then power will flow from the feeder line onto the table itself and it will be possible to drive locos right onto the table. However, as soon as the turning table line is rotated and no longer aligned with the feeder track, it will only be possible to power the loco on the table through the turntable's own dedicated controller. I'll address the details of that when we look at the turntable controller. If P8 is set to turn as well as P7, then power will flow into the yard servicing sidings and trains will be diverted that way. This siding branches at P11 into two lines for the coaling tower. One line is for locos going under the tower to receive coal, and one line is for coal trucks to go beside the tower and be winched up the rails to tip coal into the tower's hopper. Here, P11 is set to turn, so routing to the line for the coal wagons. Here, P11 is set to straight, so routing to the line for the locos being coaled. There is actually a train of wagons sitting on the line, currently on the wagon line. Here's a view of all of the controllers. Each zone has a Kato power controller in blue, 
with the rotating control handles in silver with black knobs and a Kato sound box in black. The Kato sound boxes provide sounds for the locos on each zone. Power flows from the main controller through the sound box to the track. This is necessary so that sound can be made to correspond to loco movement. There are 11 lever controllers for points and the crossover. These plug into sockets on the right side of a controller or on the right side of a sound box or into each other. They must be plugged in on the side like this in order to work since this is how they get the power to operate the points. The power to control the points through the levers is not affected in any way by the setting of power to the locos on the tracks. The power controller and sound box, box on the left are for the outer zone, the power controller and sound box on the right are for the inner zone, and the dedicated turntable controller is on the extreme right. Here are the controllers for the outer zone. The blue power controller has a switch to set power forward, off or backward, and a rotating handle to set the power from stop to full. I have things set up for both zones so that forward always means clockwise and backward means anti-clockwise. As noted, power to the track goes through the sound box. The two knobs at back on the sound box control the power level and sound rate. The knob labelled start is quite critical since this sets the range of power sent to the tracks. Normally a roughly middle position of this knob will work for most locos. But newer locos often draw considerably less power than old models, so you may find that a newer loco will continue to move even when the power handle on the blue controller is set to stop. In this case, it will be necessary to turn down the start knob on the sound box until the loco stops moving. Conversely, older models may require much more power, and if you have the start knob set for a newer loco, you may then find that an older loco will barely move even when the control handle is at full in which case you will need to turn up the start knob until the older loco starts to move as soon as the power handle is moved up. The knob labelled sync has no effect on actual power levels. Its purpose is purely to adjust the sound. As steam locos are moved using the controller and sound box, corresponding sounds of chuffing, etc. will be produced, increasing in speed as the loco moves faster. If the sound seems to be too rapid for the movement of the loco, turn the sync knob down. If the sounds are too slow for the movement of the loco, turn the sync knob up. Unfortunately, it will be often necessary to adjust the start and sync levels on the sound box when changing from operating one loco to another, especially if the models have markedly different power systems. The six buttons at left on the sound box are pressed to produce optional sounds which depend on the sound card in use. These are things like whistles, bells, brakes and coaling and watering sounds. When there is a button for brakes, it will create a brake release sound if pressed when the loco is stationary. If the loco is moving, the brake button will turn on a brake supplied sound which will then continue until the loco comes to a stop. The eject button is intended to allow sound cards to be switched without turning off power. When the eject button is pressed, all sounds will cease, although power will still be supplied to the tracks. The sound card may then be safely removed. When a new sound card has been properly inserted, the eject button is pressed again and sounds will resume using the new card. The eject button can also be used without changing cards, simply to turn sound on and off should this be desired. It should be noted that the sound boxes normally play background sounds constantly even when no loco is moving. These vary from one sound card to another but are quite loud and pronounced with some sound cards, although also subtle and hardly noticeable with some others. Here are the controllers for the inner zone, again a power controller and a sound box and a bunch of lever controllers for points. Some of the points controlled by these levers are actually on the outer zone, even though the levers are plugged into the inner controller, but this really doesn't matter. There are some additional sound cards here in front of the sound box, and the turntable controller is at the right. Here is the dedicated turntable controller. The switch at right controls the rotation of the table. Normally it is in the center stop position and the table will not be turning. When this switch is pushed to the left, the turntable will rotate anti-clockwise. When the switch is pushed to the right, the turntable will rotate clockwise. 
When the switch is returned to the center stop position, the turntable will continue to rotate in whatever direction it was going until it is aligned with the next feeder track position, and then it will stop. Note that the turntable does not sense whether or not an actual feeder track is present. It will just stop at the next feeder position, whether or not there is actually a track there. The lever at left controls the feeding of power for loco movement on the turntable. In the center off position, no movement power will be fed to the turntable, and it is important to always keep the lever in this position when not actually moving a loco on the table. When the lever points down to the white arrow, movement power will be fed for loco movement towards the little house on the table arm. When the lever points up to the black arrow, movement power will be fed for loco movement away from the little house on the table arm. This turntable control only directs the power, it does not provide it. The power comes from the main inner zone power controller and through the corresponding sound box. So to move a loco on the turntable, it is necessary to set the turntable power control to feed for the correct, correct direction and then to set the inner power controller to forward and turn up the control lever to make the loco move. And turn the power lever down again to stop the loco. Power fed this way will control a loco actually sitting on the turntable itself. It will also control a loco on any feeder track with, with which the table arm is aligned. So locos parked on the feeder track can be moved onto the table with sound. It is important not to turn on the power until the table is lined up with the track with the loco you want. Otherwise, unwanted power may be sent to locos on other tracks as the table turns past them. Note that it is also very important to turn off the table power before returning the table to align with the main access track. Otherwise, a short circuit may result, since you're basically connecting the table power with the main inner zone power. This will cause the sound box to disconnect and turn its green light to a red one. The sound boxes seem to have good protection against jams and short circuits and are quite sensitive about resetting themselves. Nevertheless, it's obviously better to avoid such things where possible as they're probably not good for the equipment. Okay, well that's basically it for command and control. Now let's quickly review the various scenic items and how they're placed on the layout. Here you can see all of the main scenic items named. All of these have, of course, been dealt with in previous videos in this series as they were being created, but I'm going to quickly run through them here. There are four stations on the layout. The main Colville station at the far side, which serves both the inner and outer zones. Scrapped off station at lower right, uh, which is by way of a country station on the outer zone. Uppingham station at centre, which is on the shared section of the inner zone, and so passed by all trains on the inner zone. And Bilsden Holt at left, which is on the inner branch of the inner zone, and so only visited by trains on that branch. Here is Colville Station. It uses Kestrel platforms and, a Metcalf, and Metcalf brick country station buildings. I had to raise the platforms with foam board underneath them to get the footbridges high enough for trains to pass, especially for the ratio of plastic bridge at the far end. Indeed, that actually needed even further raising, as by default it offers very little clearance. The nearer footbridge is from a Metcalf card kit. There are various other details on this station, a couple of water towers from Fleetline white metal kits, signs which were printed on my computer, ratio lamps, etc. The platform news kiosk is from a Metcalf card kit. The tracks through the station from right to left in this picture are the outer main line, the inner outer branch, the inner inner branch, and the yard feeder line. This is scrapped off station on the outer line. The platform is Kestrel plastic. This station originally also had a Kestrel plastic building, but I recently replaced that with this Graham Farish Scenecraft Oakworth station building, which is much nicer. I also recently added posters and milk churns. I do love this Oakworth building. It's a very nice building. This is Bilsden Holt on the inner zone, inner branch. 
The platform is from a Metcalf card kit with some special customization to fit the larger building, and the building is a Metcalf Settle in Carlisle kit. Various details here too churns, a bicycle, luggage, a car, phone boxes. This is the track side of Billsden, a bit hard to see normally as it faces the east end of the layout. Here's one of the signs for Uppingham Station. I did the signs this way beside the track as photos show the signs for the real Uppingham Station were done like this. Here's Uppingham Station itself. This was built from an old prototype models card kit based on the real Uppingham Station in Rutland. Uh, the platform is from a Metcalf card kit. Well, the far platform, the one on this side is just a little plastic platform I picked up somewhere. Uh, it's a bit hard to get a good view of this station as it sits next to the hill south of the viaduct on the shared section of the inner zone. Here you can see Uppingham Station with the sign at the other end from the far corner of the road. And here's a view of the back looking across the road. Here's a view showing pretty much the whole of the viaduct. Originally this was a Cato viaduct set and then arches from various plastic kits were added and weathered. This was the first set of arches I put in. Then I picked up and added a couple more sets. Bit of an odd mixture, but it adds some interest. The footbridge in the foreground is from an Atlas plastic kit. Here's a general view of the Cato powered turntable weathered and set down into the board. As you may see, I've now got a full semicircle of tracks on the table, some with sheds, some just as open parking tracks. It took a while for the turntable to evolve to this point, with several sets of extension tracks added over time. I did my best to weather the turntable to make it blend well into my yard area. Here are the engine sheds. Again, these have evolved quite a bit over time, with various adding and modifying. Here's the goods yard by Scrapped Off Station. The goods building is from a Metcalf goods shed card kit. Additional details from P&D Marsh, White Metal, etc. The loco in the siding is a Graham Farish Black 5. Another view of the goods shed area. And the view across the Lone Star footbridge. Kestrel water tower in the foreground. I actually have another something better in the way of a water tower on order with the intention of replacing that all being well. Vege vegetation clumps added here and there to help things along a bit. The lamp here and those on Scrapped Off and Bilston stations are P&D Marsh white metal items. Uh, the stuff at the right is from the Marsh Goods Yard set. This is the Farish Seamcraft Coaling Tower, which is modelled on the real one at Carnforth. And this is the Seamcraft Ash Plant, to automate handling of ash from locos, which is shoveled into the bin at the left, then hoisted up and tipped, tipped into the hopper in the tower so it can be loaded into wagons for hauling away. And this is the Seamcraft Sanding Plant for filling the sandboxes on locos. Here's the cattle dock, which was built from a ratio plastic and brass kit, with scenic accents, Hereford cows, and a bunch of weathering. The little hut is from a Metcalf signal box set. This is the foam-based hill in the middle of the layout. In hindsight, I should have made a better job of shaping the ground for the layout before laying track. Here are some houses from the current Metcalf brick terraced house set, and a pub from the old Metcalf corner shop and pub set. Here's a better view of the pub. P&D Marsh white metal signal gantry at the right, cable laying crew further right. Here's another view. I added the hanging sign at the left of the pub, as these seem very typical of British pubs. Here's a corner shop built from the same Metcalf kit as the pub together with the big house from the Metcalf Manor farm set at the corner of the road. On the other side of the shop are terraced houses, which were built from an older version of the Metcalf terraced house set. Looking down across the tree to that uh, corner of the road. 
Here's a general view of the sidings in the corner of the layout. Metcalf retaining wall, two sets of that at the right, and something I improvised on the far side. Another view of my improvised retaining wall with trains parked in all of the sidings. The backdrop behind Colville Station is rather iffy. It's a view of the real Colville, which I printed in sections on my computer. This building was built from the Metcalf Transport Depot set. I made it as a warehousing and distribution business. Horse and cart at right is from the P&D Marsh Goods Yard set. The row of railway cottages behind Scraptoff Station are from the Metcalf Workers' Cottage set. Two sets were used, as each set gives two pairs of cottages, and I needed three pairs to fill the row. Here's a close-up of one pair of cottages with a little doggy and a bicycle, which is a P&D Marsh white metal item. This parcel and goods building behind Scraptoff Station is from the same Metcalf Depot set as the warehousing and distribution business. The lorry is an Oxford die-cast item. Board at the end, notice board at the end of the platform is from Tiny Signs. Well, the sign is from Tiny Signs. You have to cut it out and stick it to a board and whatever yourself. These are the farm buildings behind Bilsden Holt. I picked up these buildings used at a flea market. The pigs are from Scenic Accents. This is my little airfield with a couple of planes built from Fleetline white metal kits. Here's a close-up of the two planes, nominally a tiger moth and a turbulent, not that I'd claim they came out terribly accurate. Here's the tunnel, which was built from foam with plastic portals and a printed card retaining wall. I built this coal mine from an old Builder Plus cardboard kit that I picked up, and then I added a little branch, uh, rail branch with a train to it. The loco is a refinished Farish shredded wheat item. Here's the portal going into the tunnel by the woods. And here's the other end of the tunnel towards Colville Station. This barn is from the Metcalf Manor Farm set. This is the Metcalf Crofter's Cottage, with scenic accent goats and another P&D Marsh bicycle. This little shepherd's hut is from the Metcalf Manor Farm set. The shepherd and sheep are a knock set. This cottage was from a strange old Graham Farish kit that I picked up. Plastic and foam blocks, which you had to then stick paper onto. Here's a group of cottages in the corner by the woods. The left-hand one is from that same Farish kit, and the others were bought ready-made from a flea market. This set from the flea market even have figures in the yards. The telegraph poles are ratio plastic items painted by me. This little farm shelter in the field is from the Metcalf Manor farm set. This is the level crossing by Colville Station, one set of gates from Ratio and an extra Lone Star barrier. The bus I built from a P&D Marsh white metal kit. This is the other level crossing on the layout by Scraptoff Station. Pico gates on this one, on a Cato base. I built the horse and cart at the back, but I didn't build the car and the lorry. They, those came pre-painted from P&D Marsh. And a quick swing through the signal boxes. This is the main Colville box from the Metcalf card set. And this is Colville a number two box from the same set. This is the Bilsden main box, which is from the Ratio Plastic and Brass Kit, which was a devil to build, and I guess I didn't really do a great job of it. And this is the Bilsden number two box, which is Metcalf. This is the Scrapped Off box from a Kestrel Plastic Kit. This is the Uppingham box, which is Metcalf again. And here's a bunch of Pico sheep on the farm. And Pico plastic cows in the other field. So that's it. I'm sorry this one got a bit long-winded. Please post in the comments below if you have any questions.